Hello and welcome to the news from Bahrain International. I'm Samar Ajawi. Under the patronage of His Majesty the King's Representative for Charity Works and Youth Affairs, National Security Advisor and Supreme Council for Youth and Sports Affairs Chairman, His Highness Sheikh Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa, the Rashid Equestrian and Horse Racing Club organizes 17th race this afternoon in the Rafa area in Sakhir, which was held on the cups of His Highness Sheikh Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa and the cups of his children. Her Highness Sheikh Hashima bin Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa, his Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa and His Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa. The race was also attended by the Vice President of the Supreme Commission for Equestrian and Equestrian Club, His Highness Sheikh Isa bin Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa, Vice President of the Supreme Council for Environment, His Highness Sheikh Faisal bin Rashid bin Isa Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid bin Isa Al Khalifa, his, Hain, His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Abdullah bin Isa Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Sultan al Din bin, bin Muhammad bin Salman Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Salman bin Muhammad bin Isa Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Khalid bin Ali bin Isa Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Nuh bin Muhammad bin Salman Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Isa bin Abdullah bin Isa Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Nadir bin Muhammad bin Salman Al Khalifa, His Highness Sheikh Ali bin Muhammad bin Salman Al Khalifa, along with scores of horse racing enthusiasts. His Highness Sheikh Nasser crowned the winners of His Highness's Cups and Cups of His Highness's Children as he presented the first half cup to Yusuf Tahir and the second and fourth half cups to His Highness Sheikh Sultan al Din bin Muhammad bin Salman al Khalifa and the third half cup to the winning tournament Samir David. Then His Highness presented the cups of the fifth, sixth and seventh rounds to Fauzinas.
The Council of Representatives Speaker Fawzia bint Abdullah Zainal received yesterday Pakistan's Senate Chairman Muhammad Sadiq Sanjran and the accompanying delegation currently on a visit to the Kingdom of Bahrain. She hailed strong relations binding Bahrain and Pakistan, lauding the continued cooperation between the Council of Representatives and the Legislative Branch in Pakistan, as well as joint coordination in Islamic and international parliamentary arenas. She reiterated parliamentary support to joint agreements benefiting the two brotherly countries and people in light of strong fraternal relations between His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa and Pakistan's President Arif Alvi. She stressed the importance of continuing joint work and unifying visions and stances in regional and international arenas and supporting economic efforts and expanding cooperation, particularly counterterrorism and peace efforts in the region. Pakistan Senate Chairman San Jran hailed these strong historic relations and solid cooperation, reiterating his country's unwavering stances in support of Bahrain's security and stability. The Interior Minister General Sheikh Rashid bin Abdullah Al Khalifa participated yesterday in the closing ceremony of the Joint Arabian Gulf Security II exercise that was held at the Dubai Police Academy in the United Arab Emirates. It is the second exercise for police and security organizations as part of the implementation of the decision of their highnesses and excellencies Gulf Interior Ministers. The first exercise was held in November 2016 in Bahrain to reinforce the regional cooperation and exchange of expertise to deal with the common challenges. The Interior Minister asserted that the Arabian Gulf security exercise was a turning point in security cooperation and reflected the unity in performing security duties. It also represented an enhancement to the security cooperation and coordination system and exchange of expertise between the Gulf countries to improve their capabilities to deal with challenges and fast regional changes, especially counterterrorism issues. He added that the current regional and challenges and threats require revisions of the stands and joint capabilities to be set within advanced cooperation and coordination frameworks stemming from the common fate concept. General Sheikh Rashid bin Abdullah Al Khalifa expressed thanks and appreciation to the UAE Interior Ministry for their efforts in organizing the event to achieve the goals, especially reinforcement of cooperation, expertise and experiences to face common threats. He also expressed appreciation of the advanced capabilities, readiness and competency of the participating forces and their professionalism in carrying out the exercise. The event started with performing the scenarios of the exercise, which showcased forces with their equipment, devices and personnel, improving their high skills and readiness. The training aimed to get the forces ready to deal with emergencies and enhance the preparedness between security authorities of Gulf Interior Ministries. The Interior Minister was received upon his arrival to the UAE by Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Interior Lieutenant General Sheikh Saif bin Zayed Al Nahyan. After that, their Highnesses and Excellencies, Gulf Interior Ministers, toured the Expo 2020 that is being hosted in Dubai for the first time in the MENA and South Asia regions under the theme Connecting Minds, Creating the Future. Bahrain takes part in the exhibition to highlight its geographic contributions to promoting trade and creativity. The Interior Minister was briefed about the event that will be held from October the 20th to April the 10th.
The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in coordination with the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Interior, has activated several procedures related to arrivals to the Kingdom of Bahrain in light of the outbreak of the coronavirus COVID-19. The procedures include banning entry to all foreign visitors who have visited the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Kingdom of Thailand, the Republic of Singapore, the Kingdom of Malaysia, and the Republic of South Korea within 14 days of their date of arrival in the Kingdom. Bahraini citizens, GCC citizens, and Bahraini residents who have visited Iran, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, or South Korea within 40 days of arriving to Bahrain will be subject to quarantine and enhanced testing procedures recommended by the World Health Organization. The Ministry advises citizens and residents to follow WHO guidelines and avoid all but essential travel to areas where coronavirus has been detected. Saudi Arabia's Royal Air Defense Forces have intercepted several ballistic missiles launched by the Iranian-backed terrorist Houthi militia from Yemen, targeting cities in the kingdom. The coalition's spokesperson, Colonel Turki al-Maliki, said the attack took place at 3 a.m. local time after projectiles were launched from the Yemeni capital, Sana'a. Colonel al-Maliki said that the missiles were launched in a deliberate and systematic manner in order to target cities and civilians in Saudi Arabia, describing the attack as a flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. Saudi Foreign Minister Prince Faisal bin Farhan said the ongoing Houthi attacks show that the militia is not serious about a solution to the Yemen conflict. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo visited Saudi Arabia's Prince Sultan Air Base. A visit, he says, reaffirms America's determination to stand with Saudi Arabia in the face of Iranian aggression. Pompeo visited American troops after talks with custodian of the two holy mosques, King Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, on the second day of a visit focused on countering Iran. The U.S. began building up its military presence at the Prince Sultan Air Base south of Riyadh last year following a series of attacks in the Gulf that Washington and Riyadh have blamed on their common foe Iran. The top U.S. diplomat also met with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and Deputy Defense Minister Prince Khaled bin Salman. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo today arrived in Oman and he will meet with Sultan Haytham bin Tariq Al Said. Oman has close ties with both Washington and Tehran and that has previously provided a back channel for talks between the adversaries. Oman's Minister of Foreign Affairs greeted Pompeo upon his arrival to Muscat. He had been quoted as saying that his government is in touch with the U.S. and Iran and believes the possibility exists for dialogue between them. Pompeo, who has been traveling overseas, including a stop in Saudi Arabia, will also pay respects to the family of Sultan Qaboos bin Said, who passed away last month. German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas welcomed his Saudi counterpart, Prince Faisal bin Farhan al Saud, in Berlin today for discussions on several international issues, including the war in Yemen and the Iranian nuclear deal. Maas expressed concern over the increased fragility of the nuclear agreement and said his country was committed to a path of dialogue. The Iranian agreement with world powers, signed in 2015, has been on the verge of collapse since U.S. President Donald Trump withdrew from the agreement last year and imposed unilateral sanctions on the country. Iranians have seen the price of basic goods skyrocket, inflation and unemployment increase, and the local currency plummet since then. And after a U.S. drone attack that killed a top Iranian general in January, Iran announced it would no longer respect the limits set on how many centrifuges it can use to enrich uranium. During today's news conference, Prince Farhan al Saud said Saudi Arabia was very worried about Iranian intervention in Syria and in Yemen. Yemen's conflict with began in 2014 takeover of the capital by the Houthis who control much of the country's north. Saudi-led coalition launched by military campaign months later is determined to restore the legitimate government and oust the rebels. Prince Farhan al Saud said that he took the opportunity to offer condolences for a racially motivated shooting on Wednesday in Hanau which killed nine people. The U.S. Department of the Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control sanctioned five Iranian members of the Guardian Council, which oversees the parliamentary elections in Iran. Washington accused them of abusing their power of vetting candidates' eligibility to run and depriving the Iranian nation of a free and fair elections. The Treasury said the Trump administration would not tolerate 
the manipulation of the elections to favor the regime's malign agenda. The Guardian Council, which reports directly to the Supreme Leader, allowed approximately 7,150 candidates to run out for more than 14,000. Accordingly, a third of sitting parliamentarians were banned from running again. A global dirty money watchdog today placed Iran on its blacklist after the country failed to comply with international anti-terrorism financing norms. The decision comes after more than three years of warnings from the Paris-based Financial Action Task Force, FATF, urging Tehran to enact terrorist financing conventions. However, the FATF appeared to leave the door ajar for Iran, saying countries should also be able to apply countermeasures independently of any call by the FATF to do so. The United Nations said today that ceasefire talks between the forces fighting over the Libyan capital Tripoli were back on track. This comes days after the UN-recognized government of the National Accord pulled out of negotiations as its foes shelled the city's port. Libyan National Army Commander Khalifa Haftar said he would be ready for a ceasefire if Turkish and Syrian mercenaries left the country and Ankara stopped supplying weapons to Libya's UN-recognized government in Tripoli. The commander also said the LNA does not mind having EU countries patrol the front lines to preserve the ceasefire. Algeria's president, Abdel Majid Taboun, has asked in the face of his country's insistent protest movement for time to implement radical changes. Taboun said the country cannot reform, repair and restore that which was destroyed over a decade in two months. He has been slammed by protesters as representing the running elite they want removed. Having served several times as minister and once briefly as prime minister during former leader Abdel Aziz Bouteflika's two-decade rule, the president, who after his election extended a hand to the Hirak movement to build a new Algeria, said he has prioritized political reform. Germany's top security official said today that authorities will step up police presence throughout the country and keep a closer watch out on mosques and other sites after the radically motivated shootings that killed nine people. A 43-year-old German man fatally shot the victims of immigrant backgrounds in the Frankfurt suburb of Hanau on Wednesday night before killing his mother and himself. The man, identified as Tobias Rathjen, left a number of rambling texts and videos espousing racist views and claiming to have been under surveillance since birth. Interior Minister Horst Seehofer said state-level security officials and security agencies consulted yesterday and had agreed to increase law enforcement presence around the country. Seehofer said there would be more surveillance at sensitive sites, including mosques and a high police presence at railway stations, airports and borders. The attack came amid mounting concern about far-right extremism reflected in earlier attacks and the rise of the anti-migrant party alternative for Germany. The virus-stricken Chinese city of Wuhan is stepping up efforts to contain the epidemic with the city's largest newly built shift hospital opening its doors to patients. The Guangguihai Hospital has nearly 3,700 beds, with every 20 beds as a separate ward. So far, 15 makeshift hospitals have been completed in Wuhan, housing more than 9,000 patients. Authorities have promised to increase capacity to handle 30,000 patients. Wuhan is also upgrading more ordinary hospitals into special ones for the virus patients. China reported a further fall in new virus cases to 889 today, as health officials expressed optimism over containment of the outbreak that has caused more than 2,200 deaths and is spreading elsewhere. Earlier, China's consulate general in Karachi reiterated his country's efforts against the coronavirus and speculated that the outbreak may be over as soon as March. Talking to Meet the Press program at Karachi Press Club, the ambassador said that experts in China believed the peak of the epidemic had already arrived. The government has been maintaining an open, transparent, and responsible attitude to deal with this virus. And, uh, you know, it may be that in the very beginning, because of the outbreak come, come in a sudden, and because that is also the time that all, most of the Chinese people, 
they went back to the homeland to celebrate the Spring Festival. And the whole country is in the mood of festival. And people are not, you know, get ready to deal with this outbreak. The spread of this virus has been under control in the whole country, in the whole country. I will say that, you know, according to the experts uh, in China, that the ceiling, the peak of the epidemic has already arrived. And uh, it will come down, it will come down, no matter from the epicenter and across the whole China. This will come down this week and the next week. And this epidemic may be go over by end of March. A spokesperson for the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, said today that violence and brutal attacks against civilians had contributed to the displacement of more than 700,000 people in Burkina Faso over the past year. During a briefing about Africa's Sahel region, the spokesperson for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Andre Maikic, said that the large geographical area which includes Burkina, Faso, Niger, Mali and various other countries is facing an emergency that urgently needs addressing. Mahicic said that violence and the frequency of attacks in Sahel region had increased contributing to the high numbers of displaced people. Egypt's once reviled street dogs are now finding popular acceptance. Volunteers are raising awareness against them and putting them down and organizing campaigns to vaccinate them. Street dogs in Egypt were for centuries stigmatized by society and the government says there's around 15 million of them. They bite some 200,000 people a year, according to the World Health Organization, and spread rabies. But now the stray dogs are finding popular acceptance and along with it, surging grassroots support. That includes adoption and medical care, as well as spraying and neutering to keep them from producing more puppies on the streets. These efforts are making inroads against the prevailing government policy of extermination by poison.